I want to welcome everybody to the uh, to the presentation today. Um, I uh, especially want to thank uh, Michael Storr and uh, Ruth Allison from the Intact uh, Collaborative, to uh, who have kindly agreed to present with us today. Uh, this is brought to you by the Youth Employment Solutions Center, and uh, which is a partnership between TASH and Transcend. And we're providing technical assistance uh, to the PI grant states, partnerships and employment uh, states. These are ACL funded uh, systems change initiatives. And uh, the technical assistance is going to the states of Kentucky, DC, Utah, Cal uh, Hawaii, Massachusetts, and South Carolina. And a lot of our colleagues who who are on this webinar today uh, is uh, it are are the states that uh, we're supporting with this. And but we also open this uh, this webinar up to the past Pi Grant states or, and uh, anybody else who may have an interest in the topic, uh, because it's around systems change and it's a focus on employment for youth. Uh, the the concept of collaboration, particularly between schools and VR, uh, is center center most in our thoughts. And so uh, we're really excited about the opportunity today uh, to bring bring this information to you. And uh, uh, not only does Intact Collaborative work nationally with, uh, with all the states in relation to transition related services, but they have their finger on, you know, where we're seeing some of the best practices. And, and we're really excited to have uh, the states of California and Iowa uh, also presenting today. And I uh, wanna thank all of those folks too, uh, who've given up of their time and, and their expertise to share with us today. So with that, no further ado, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Michael and Ruth. Great, thanks so much, Dale, I appreciate that. And as we get started, we'd like to see who is with us today. So uh, not only for our presenters to know who's in the audience, but for all of you to see who is here. So what we'd like you to do is in the chat feature, if you could tell us your name, your role, your agency, your department or state that you're working in, um, just some basic information so we know who is in our uh, audience today. So please go ahead and put that in the chat as we continue with the presentation. So with us today, our presenters, uh, as uh, Dale had mentioned, Ruth Allison, who works with me at the National Technical Assistance Center on Transition, the collaborative. Also, we have with us Mary Jackson from Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation Services, Kristen Lane from Iowa Department of Education, and Linda O'Neill, um, who wears a number of hats, one of which is working at San Diego State University. And she'll describe a little bit more about um, herself uh, during her section of today's presentation. So our agenda today, um, we did want to engage our, um, you all um, in this presentation, as well as our two guest state. Uh, so we have Linda O'Neill again from California and Mary and Kristen from Iowa. Um, and in looking at our collaborations considerations on a Jay's agenda, we're going to discuss using various service delivery methods to provide instruction and activities and services for students and youth. We're going to look at some issues surrounding collaboration and program development and evaluation and looking at building state and local capacity. So we first want to discuss the importance of collaboration in implementing a variety of service delivery methods. These might include supports for at home learning, virtual learning, and in-person learning opportunities. We know that these continue to be really challenging times. When the COVID-19 started in March of 2020, and well, one ever anticipated that one year later, we would still be seeing the impact of the pandemic. The impact of COVID-19 continues to directly impact the instructional learning models that are occurring in schools throughout the country with states and local districts using at-home learning packets, learning in virtual environments, and some type of hybrid formats. And this is still occurring um, even as the vaccines are rolling out. You know, it, it really varies from state to state and local areas. It's also important to note that this continues to affect not just the education system, but also VR agencies and all our agency partners and stakeholders 
and how they're working, collaborating, and supporting secondary transition aid students with disabilities. This slide discusses a few tips regarding how to develop and maintain collaboration between education, VR, and all our stakeholders who support transition age students and youth. It's important to maintain communication and clearly define what activities and services that a student is receiving from education, VR, and other professionals working with that student. So there's some really good suggestions um, that we obtained over this past year from folks that work in uh, various states across the country. It's important to acknowledge that although the landscape in terms of service delivery for students with disabilities has definitely changed, the expectations and requirements to continue to provide pre-employment transition services and all transition services for students with disabilities has not. VR and education are still required to provide transition activities and services, including pre-employment transition services statewide to any student with a disability who needs those services and is eligible or potentially eligible for VR services, as well as transition services to eligible students and youth with disabilities. And all schools are required to provide students with disabilities access to free appropriate public education or FAPE and if appropriate, special education and related services. So this slide is simply a graphic that depicts the various ways you can deliver pre-employment and transition services under IDA. Delivery should be tailored to meet the needs of each individual student, either through individualized instruction, delivered in a group setting, or provided virtually. Almost all activities that can be done individually or in a group setting can also be adapted to a virtual setting so long as the student has access to the internet and a web-based platform. In fact, some of the most effective practices that we have seen over this past year often evolve a combination of all types of service delivery. And with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Ruth. All right, thanks, Michael. Um, as the dog on the slide is showing, we need to develop a map out a written plan. And as we have worked with teams across the country, we have found eight common strategies or components that are critical to successful collaboration between VR and education. First, for students to benefit for VR services, education and VR need to develop a process to really connect students to VR. Figuring out a systematic way to share information with students and families about the benefit of VR as well as identify those processes to ensure that needed VR paperwork is completed and returned is essential. Otherwise, what we often hear is that a teacher referred a student to VR only to learn later that paperwork wasn't returned. So developing this initial process is really important. One of the main reasons uh, for VR and education to collaborate is really to leverage and expand the services available to students. Uh, conducting an environmental scan or doing some type of resource mapping to really determine what services are currently available through the school and then develop a plan and jointly map out those VR services uh, that will be provided in the school. By doing this, it really allows education and VR to leverage their capacities in delivering services to students and really creating that robust transition program we want in all of our districts. Uh, we know having an effective communication structure is key in any collaboration, and we have seen uh, the most effective teams really have developed an infrastructure or processes around their communication, which keeps all uh, partners informed, and we're talking both at the system level and the individual student level. Uh, part of the resource mapping process is really to identify the appropriate curricula or resources that will be incorporated into program and services. And as VR and education are building the services, we want to make sure what we're offering students is um, actually working and achieving a positive outcome. Therefore, it's really important to determine uh, how student participation progress and outcomes will be tracked and reported and measured, as well as how will you make uh, adjustments if you're not achieving the outcomes you want. Additionally, identify ways to enhance student and family engagement, understanding uh, one size doesn't fit all. And the last strategy we want to highlight is really to the need to develop business partnerships. 
Um, over the past year, due to COVID-19, the pandemic has, has um, been increasingly important to identify strategies to some support remote service delivery. And this slide provides a link to a handout developed by the Regional Education Laboratory Central out of Oregon, and it provides strategies for bridging that dig digital divide during remote learning. The strategies are organized under four areas to really support the development of remote learning plans, really along a continuum of er internet access from students that have um, access to high speed internet, to a hybrid, to even offline strategies. It's not an exhaustive list, but it, it's um, strategies that have been um, uh, provided from districts across the United States. And, and there's four different um, kind of buckets. It's infrastructure, instru instructional support, student support, and parent guardian support. So make sure to check it out. And there's a link to that. Uh, next slide, Michael. And whether we're working virtually or face-to-face, -face, um, the need for collaboration is important. And if we're providing remote services, uh, VR and education staff should really discuss and coordinate instructional models and virtual learning platforms that are being used for instruction. For example, if a school is using a Zoom format for instruction, it might be advantageous for VR to look at using that same format. And we know with even within a district, it might be different for different schools. So having those one-to-one -one conversations with school to determine uh, what platform is being used is important. Additionally, just like when we're working face-to-face -face and need to communicate and, and share progress and updates on, on students and what activities and services they're involved in, we need to be doing the same thing virtually. So as we're providing services within BR, share that information to education and vice versa. Next slide, Michael. Looking at a few more points to consider when we're talking about VR and education collaboration, uh, we cannot overstate the importance of having administrative engagement and support for the collaboration between VR and education. Uh, if you think about it, administration at the school really sets the tone and if they're on board with the collaboration, uh, it's going to be more successful. Additionally, VR supervisors need to be on board and be available and willing to problem solve uh, as issues come up. Often a great way to get administrative buy-in if you don't have it is, is to focus on out, outcomes. School and, and VR both have uh, similar outcomes, student outcomes um, they're responsible for. So that's a great way to start that conversation. Uh, because VR and education have similar roles and responsibilities, it's important to have a conversation and really uh, identify individual joint roles and responsibilities. And this is a place that you might want to look even broader uh, because there are uh, other partners that are critical in secondary transition. So you might look at mental health, uh, disability, um, um, independent living centers, et cetera, uh, in terms of how you can leverage all those partnerships. Uh, when um, having a point of contact for each of the school districts is really helpful uh, for VR, a point person that really helps them navigate uh, the school environment. Additionally, schools appreciate having a one contact for VR. We know multiple staff members might be going into schools now with uh, pre-employment transition services, but having that one person school can contact is important. Uh, also, once VR staff uh, is coming back into the school, having a, a space and a schedule is important. This is good for school and VR and students so they know when to expect the VR counselor. And once again, uh, just make sure uh, we're keeping families um, in, informed about the processes. Next slide. So we know partnerships take effort, but we also know um, how to partner effectively uh, really collaborate, it's worth it because it's good for kids. And I think uh, this multicolored interwoven rope on this slide is a good depiction of the multiple systems, programs, and people students will interact with during their transition years. And really because of the complexities of those systems and programs, it's really necessary for us to figure out this, this collaboration to really ease the complication and misunderstanding of information that students and families often experience during this time period. And research does tell us that uh, when we work together, uh, effectively interagency is a predictor of students having a post school, a positive post school outcome. So it's important we figure this stuff out. Next slide. If you haven't seen the OSHA 
2020 transition guidance letter. We encourage it, you to review it. It just emphasizes the importance of the joint coordination and collaboration between VR and education. As, and as Michael said, um, the requirements to provide pre-eds and IDA transition services didn't change within COVID. So it talks about that. And then it also encourages uh, VR and education to be creative in their approaches um, during this unusual time. Next slide. Um, in the OSHA, in the OSER's um, guidance letter, it also references the transition guide to post-secondary education and employment for students and youth with disabilities. Um, that was uh, revised and released by OSERS in August of 2020. This is a great guide to check out as well, and it provides uh, in-depth information about uh, collaboration and coordination between the two entities. And there's a link on the slide there that you can access that as well. Great, thank you so much, Ruth. And we're now gonna turn this over and we have a poll question we'd like to ask you all. So we're gonna go ahead and launch a poll. And the question is, um, how often do you see interagency collaboration as a driver of positive post-school employment outcomes for students with disabilities? Never, rarely, sometimes, usually, or always. So go ahead and um, please go ahead and answer. And we'll give you all um, under a minute. So go ahead and I'll ask Donald to let us uh, know when we kind of have had a majority of you answer and we'll go ahead and share those results. And here's the results, thank you. And it looks like the majority of folks, well, it's a sometimes usually um, answer to that. Um, so uh, that's good, uh, but it's not never or rarely, but I think ideally what we'd love to see in this country is that the shared interagency collaboration is always occurring. And I think the purpose of today's webinar really is to discuss how we can move from that sometimes into that always category. So thank you uh, so much for uh, joining us in that poll. And we're gonna go ahead and move on. And we're gonna actually ask our two state teams that same question. So um, Linda and Mary and Chris, Kirsten, if you could go ahead and um, open up your videos and your mics. Um, and maybe Linda, I'll start with you um, in California. How? Frequently, do you see interagency collaboration as a driver? And what are some uh, good examples that you have noticed in California? All right. Hi to everyone. Thanks for having me. I would say in California, uh, we always use interagency collaboration, whether it's on the state level or whether it's in regions or in our local communities. Absolutely um, essential. Uh, what we see is it makes our work more uh, efficient and more effective. And I can also tell you that it makes our work a lot more fun. So I would encourage everybody to look at it. And um, when I get to my part in this presentation, I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Thank Great. you. Thank, thanks so much, Linda. Um, and then over to Mary and Kristen um, in Iowa. What is What are your thoughts on that particular question? This is Mary. Oh. Hey, and I'm Kirsten. They're so collaborative, they're talking <laughs> they together. <laughs> well, and that's kind of indicative of how Mary and I work. We work pretty closely together. Um, and uh, I, I really am proud to say in Iowa, I feel like we've had a really long history of um, both state level and local level collaboration with Voc Rehab. And um, it's made all the difference. I, I don't... Um, I don't do a lot of um, work around employment unless Mary's involved. I, if, if we're working on employment, then there are ways that we can share the work and share the, the process. And um, it just has become a natural way that we do business. I would say, like Linda says, from the state level and the local level, um, it's critical. And I would say we do it all the time. And this is Mary. I 
just to piggyback, I 100% agree with what Kirsten just said. Interagency collaboration, it's such a huge component for when we're having successful outcomes for students with disabilities. There's just not one entity that can do it all. And so sometimes it's a lot of work in the beginning to work through developing those relationships and developing some of the things we'll talk about a little bit later on, the documents or, or guidance. But when you get through that part and, and you see the collaboration working across the state, um, um, is really when, like Linda said, it's it's fun. It it makes services happen, and it makes sense to be doing it that way. Great, thank you so much, and I look forward to uh, hearing from you in a few minutes, um, and actually look at some of the logistics and uh, the forms that you all use. So, thank you so much. So we also wanted to share with you just some of the resources that we have at NTAC the Collaborative, um, as well as uh, one of the resources that uh, Linda O'Neill through Orange County um, had shared with us um, and some of the resources that they have. Um, it's important in interagency collaborations for service delivery uh, that goals are set, that teams, whether these are state teams, regional teams, or direct local teams. So that school district working with their VR and other agency partners, look at their strengths and then analyze the services and gaps that they have uh, in service delivery uh, to look at where they can make changes to best support those transition age students. Also this idea of interagency agreements or memorandums of understanding at both the state level and the local level are really important. So some of the resources that are shared on this slide our examples, um, one was back to our old center, so when it was NTAC and WinTAC, our interagency agreement toolkit for vocational rehabilitation and education, as well as our resource mapping and flow of services. And these can all be found at our current website for NTAC, the collaborative at um, our, our TA uh, resources site, um, as well as one of the resources that Linda is going to share. So with that, um, we do have another poll question, and this one is actually two poll questions. Um, these two questions, one is talking about uh, looking at cross-agency agreements and how they drive outcomes. And the second poll question is looking at a common planning process. So um, if we could go ahead and launch the poll. And if you could answer both of those, we'd appreciate it. So we'll give you a little bit extra time because there's two questions on this particular poll. And in thinking about this question again, I think it's at the different levels that you all are working at, whether you're at, at the state level or at the regional or local level, and thinking about how your cross-agency agreements drive your collaboration and activities, and then how that uh, common planning practice is actually utilized to drive your, not only your outcomes, but your regularly scheduled team meetings. Okay, great. So with the first question, do cross-agency agreements drive collaborative activities or outcomes? Um, it looks like that sometimes that occurs. Uh, that was the majority of folks at almost 50%. Uh, and I think really in looking at that, um, and it's something that I know we have strived uh, working, especially when uh, we were working with NTAC and WinTAC and now in our uh, NTAC, the collaborative process, it really does appear that, um, you know, to make that those agreements as effective as possible so that those are meaningful um, and that there's information in there that is actually driving um, not only compliance, but effective practices to support our students and youth as um, they leave high school and go into adult life as they transition. Um, and if 
I can just, if you can just slide down and let's look at the results of question two. I don't know if that's possible, maybe. I don't know, Don, if you can just slide down, I'm just seeing the top part on that one. Uh, maybe I can, okay, sorry. <laughs> I could slide it down myself. Um, does a common planning process drive collaborative activities and around comes with regularly scheduled team meetings? And that was often. Um, so I think that's good um, that, that states that you all are working in. Um, your time that you schedule um, and your activities that you are doing to engage your uh, partners um, is a driving force. So again, thank you. Thank you for participating in that poll. So we next are going to go ahead back to our state partners. And we have um, up first um, from Iowa, um, Mary and Thurston, and they're going to talk a little bit about addressing these two questions about cross agencies agreements and meetings and collaboration. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Mary and Thurston. Hey, thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, Mary and I have um, recently revised the MOA. We've had an MOA in Iowa between vocational rehabilitation and the Department of Education for quite some time, but we revised it recently using the checklist that WinTech and NTech have provided. And um, I'll just tell you that if you haven't used that, that's a really helpful tool. It really does help you to focus on the important parts of um, the required parts as well as the important parts of the collaboration. And so this is a copy of, of our MOA and um, certainly not going to go through every bit of it, but some of the things that we wanted to point out, um, the first and second sections are really uh, about the purpose and consultation and TA and so kind of general stuff. But then when you get into the third section, we really talk a lot um, about some of the shared considerations around transition planning. And, and I think it's really been a struggle for folks to figure out, you know, before WIOA, Voc Rehab had a different kind of role in the transition planning process. And with WIOA, they get involved so much earlier and they're involved on an ongoing basis. And, and there's so much overlap between some of the things that they can do and the things that education was um, doing with students around transition planning. And so we really talk a little bit about some of that overlap in section three. But the real meat, I think, of our agreement is in section four, where we really spell out roles and responsibilities and try to be very specific about what VR's responsibilities are and the Department of Education in conjunction with our AEAs, which are our regional units, and then our LEAs, which are our local school districts. But we talk about um, costs, we talk about responsibilities in tasks, um, funding, all of those kinds of things. But um, as, as critical or as specific as we tried to get in this, there, there were still some unanswered questions. Um, so we have, and we'll show you in just a few minutes, a, an FAQ that we developed in response to the questions that came up after we went through this. But um, one of the things that's in here is, is talking about our, uh, the Prietz agreement. Um, and, and that's always been a challenge, like making sure that we're getting that signed and that students have access to um, the Prietz services as soon as possible. And um, one of the things that we're doing in conjunction with that is um, with our new IEP system, we'll be adding in uh, a place where um, we link right to the Prietz agreement and right during the IEP meeting, we'll be able to pull up and include that Prietz agreement and talk about what Prietz services are and get that signed as a part of that IEP meeting. So we're really excited about that. Um, Section five, and, and again, I'm not gonna walk through all of these things, but you could see there's a lot of detail. Then we get into I, I, outreach and identification um, and how, how we work together to make sure that, um, that we're identifying the students who need services. And then the final section is our 511th section that just talks about um, 
um, ensuring that student, all students have access to um, employment training and that we are transitioning students to competitive integrated employment rather than to um, sub-minimum wages. Mary, is there anything that you would add to um, discussion about the MOA? I think the only thing I would add is this, and I've seen some comments in chat saying, you know, an MOU is good to have, but it's really kind of that state level guidance. And you're right, that's exactly what it is. It's really that state level guidance that helps support the local initiatives. Um, so really it's, it's showing the support between the Department of Education in Iowa and IVRS. And, it's, and it includes information about our local education agencies. But when you break it down to the local level, we have another document here in a minute that we're gonna go over that breaks it down to the local level. But in order what we found to drive some of those efforts at the local level is we needed the support at the state level so it really goes hand in hand and you can't have one without the other is what we found out in Iowa um, this MOA overall helps us define the responsibilities between the entities and it really helps us try and minimize the duplication as much as possible and I know Kirsten just went over those sections so um, hopefully if you guys have a chance or have something like this developed in your state you guys can understand how this can help drive some of those local efforts when you have the support at the state level for moving forward. And I don't know, Kristen, if you had anything else to add about the MOA or if we wanted to jump over then to the local school plan. Let's jump to the local school plan, but Michael, I used the wrong one. So I am going to put into the chat um, the link for the, uh, oh, sorry, not the local school plan. I'm sorry, the FAQs, because I think that's the step right between the local school plan and the MOA where we really took the MOA, which is somebody, Mary, you said in the chat, people talked about how, um, you know, that's kind of broad and doesn't really hit the, where, where the rubber hits the road. Um, but our FAQs are really more of that application. So really taking the guidance from the MOU and the questions that came from that, well, how do we apply this? What, how do we use this in our local setting? And really, um, answered those questions in a way that was really practical and meaningful for schools. And so within those FAQs, um, like we said, we tried to be really specific in the roles and responsibilities section here, but there were still some things that would come up. And so we um, tried to provide that application there. Um, we also connected that letter that Ruth was just referring to and our link isn't working either. I just checked it. So the letter from the U.S. Department of Education about um, transition services. But if you read through the topics, they're hyperlinked in that link that I shared about the FAQs. And we go through um, everything from just kind of an overall, what's the difference between our VR agency and um, Iowa Department for the Blind, which provides services for students with um, vision impairments and blindness to general terminology and then get into some really service delivery kinds of things. And then the final two sections are around collaboration. And all of those are hyperlinked. So if there's a question that, that um, applies to you, then you can click on it and zoom right down to the answer. But um, we felt that this was really helpful as people moved into the local school plan, which was the next section that I think we're gonna talk about. And just to add to that, in Iowa, so you guys know how we're structured, I'm representing um, VR General. We also have the agency, Iowa Department for the Blind, that serves, obviously, um, individuals who are blind in the state of Iowa. So we do have separate agencies, but that just adds to the complexity behind needing to collaborate because we're both um, responsible for delivering pre ats activities in, in Iowa and other um, transition related services. And so that they were a partner at the table when we developed this frequently asked questions or FAQ so that we can make sure that we differentiate between the two and who serves which population and how we can all collaborate together to meet those students needs. So I think then we'll just move on to the local school plan, which is really where the student level impact comes into play. Um, the local school plan, I have to give hats off to Voc Rehab because they are the ones who initiated this several years ago, Mary, what, five maybe? Five-ish years ago? About five now. 
And, and it's been an evolution for sure, as far as how it's been used and, and the impact that it's had within districts. Because initially, um, I have to say it, it began as that one more thing, that an, another, another plan, another piece of paper to fill out kind of thing. Um, but it has really evolved into um, some schools, definitely more so than others, but into a um, planning and problem solving kind of tool. So um, if you look at, you know, it's filled out each school year has to be turned in by um, November in each for each school year, and then it's a one year plan. But it talks generally about LEA and IVRS responsibilities at the top there. And those are just general um, guidance around filling out the plan. It refers to our MOA. So um, people can refer back to that to, to, um, for guidance as they're developing the plan. But then if you scroll down just a little bit more, that's where the individualization comes in. So each of the five Prietz areas are included as well as specific address, um, a specific boxes to address um, the job coaching that happens as a part of the instructional plan within the IEP and job coaching that might happen as a, far, as a part of a career job for a student as they're transitioning out of school. But within each of these sections then, the local school talks about what are the things they're doing around job counseling or job exploration counseling, counseling on opportunities, work-based learning, et cetera, through the pre-ets and the um, coaching parts of things. And then VR talks, you know, they work together to determine how are they gonna meet the needs of students in each of these areas. There's an additional column or can be more than one additional column where you add in other agencies like Mary was just saying with the um, Iowa Department for the Blind where um, they might be a partner in this or a community resource provider um, within the community um, workforce development. There are lots of different agencies that could also play a role in um, this plan, but really looking at how do we cover all of this in the most efficient and effective way for students. Mary? And we also developed an implementation guide for um, local teams on writing and developing these plans. Um, we haven't shared the implementation guide yet because it isn't actually finalized and we haven't done the training across Iowa because COVID impacted that. So it's been delayed a little bit, um, but like the individual had said in the chat, you know, a, a state level MOA is great, but what happens when it kind of gets lost in translation or when you get down to the local level? That's part of that implementation guide is making sure people are aware of the MOA, um, that they're aware of WIOA or the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. We want to make sure that they're aware of those things and that as new teachers are being hired and they're part of these local school planning meetings, that those are talked about and, and that they're educated each year as a reminder because it's a lot of information and we get that it's a lot of information for these teams to go over but we want to make sure it's at the forefront of the minds of everybody who is working collaboratively together that these are here and they're here to assist with defining these roles and responsibilities so that state level MOA or memorandum of agreement really gives that state level guidance but these local school plans break it down at the local level to make sure that we are minimizing those duplication but that services are being provided to students with disabilities and that we are collaborating and that everybody is aware of what that collaboration looks like. Great, thank you so much for sharing. And again, if you have questions, we are gonna have a um, Q and A at the end of today's webinar. So please go ahead and type those in. And uh, thank you, Kristen and Mary. And I'm gonna go ahead now and turn this over to Linda O'Neill from California. All right, thank you, Michael. I'm happy to be here. I'm gonna to talk today about the California Department of Rehabilitation and how they have worked with us as education and community partners for a long time. Uh, I'm from Inner Work Institute, San Diego State uh, University, and um, we've done some exciting work with uh, all of the folks, not only in California, but in our local county, uh, Orange County. All right, next slide, please. All of the materials that I'll refer to today can be found on the Google Drive that you see on the slide. And I'm not sure, um, Michael, if you're going to take this particular Google Drive access and make sure people have it, but hopefully you'll want to see some of the documents that I am referring to today. 
Next slide, please. All right, I just wanted to show you all of the items that are in there at this point. I believe there are 16 documents and um, you're free to use any of the information any way that you might like and hopefully you'll find some interesting materials. Next slide, please. All right, one of the things that we've been working on in Orange County through the Chapman University Thompson Policy Institute is a website that we are happy to share with all of you. It's called transitionca.org. And if you go to the next page, I'll show you a little bit about the front page. We have a lot of really great information that we've put together over the last couple of years. We have student interns at Chapman that work on this uh, website daily to get new information on there, new resources. We wanna make sure that individuals with disabilities families, service providers, educators, and business partners can get into this website and get transition information that they need and want. Next slide, please. Um, this last year, we've worked on a COVID resources section. So we have lots of resources that have been uh, provided through people um, in California, um, locally. Also, we have uh, information coming from national sources. And we wanted to make sure that families and other stakeholders could get access to important COVID-19 information. And so we have them organized into folders, as you see there. Um, there's information about uh, benefits planning and management and technology and lots of really other great information. So feel free to go to that website and hopefully you'll find some really good information there. Keep in mind that we've just started the website. It's still being built and um, we want to continue to make it better and make sure that it's current. Next slide. All right, I wanna tell you a little bit about the great work that the California Department of Rehabilitation has done through federally funded grant programs. And we've done a lot of research with um, our group in California since 2003. We started with the Bridges to Youth Self-Sufficiency Project. We um, had a California Promise Initiative and we're currently involved in the California Career Innovations Grant, which will be ending at the end of this September. And I can tell you because of the Department of Rehabilitation, we have been able to um, really take a look at some of the important practices that we should all be following in terms of transition programming, employment preparation, um, family support, and lots of other things. So um, we are very fortunate to have the grants and I'll tell you a little bit about them. So let's go to the next slide, please. Oh, okay. I think we're a little bit out of order. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think that's the next one. That is we... it? Okay, sorry. All right, well, that will go no with the current one. This is the California yeah. Career Innovations Grant, and it was funded by the U.S. Of, uh, Department of Education, Office of Rehabilitative Services Administration, and it was funded in 2017. And let's go to the next slide. All right, so... I think the slides got a little bit out of order when I sent them to you. But anyways, what I can tell you is whenever we worked on the first grant, which is the Bridges to Youth Self-Sufficiency Project, and that project was specifically for individuals who were receiving supplemental security income. So all of the youth were low income and uh, we covered services for all different types of ethnicities. And not only did we work with the students, we worked with the families. But before we started this grant, um, we had, I would say, minimal collaboration. Um, and what we found is that school districts throughout California, you know, they had a little bit of work experience going on. They did a little bit of work with transportation. Uh, they did some work with the Department of Rehabilitation through our transition partnership program. And some of our uh, workability school districts were given a little bit of money by the California Department of Education to work on employment. After we started with the Bridges to Youth Self-Sufficiency Project, we learned a lot about collaboration. And this, what the next slide will show you what our collaboration looks like. All right. So from that particular project, we really learned about the importance of seeking out different community agencies who could provide the type of services that each student and their family needed. And so we learned the importance of individualization, we learned the importance of knowing what's in your community. 
We learned the importance of person-centered planning and how important each student was. And we spent a lot of time identifying all of the partnerships that were in the community that would help each individual student. And these collaborations were going on all over California and the community looked a little bit different depending on what community it was, what county it was. And it was very interesting to watch. Um, we all shared information across counties and we came up with some really great ways and strategies that could support students who we know needed to get a job. We had to convince the families in the very beginning that this was an important road to go down because these students were all on supplemental security income. But um, the families were really excited to go on the journey with us. They appreciated having uh, the resources and information and knowing how to access them. Before we started these projects, we would hand over a booklet and say, all right, here's the resources. We hope you're gonna have a good time going to get these and um, we hope everything works out for you. What we found out is that the families really needed a lot of support in how to access those services and how to support their children um, as they were going into work experiences and on into paid employment and even on into post-secondary education. Next slide, please. All right, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the California um, Competitive Integrated Employment Blueprint for Change. And I want you to know that this is the uh, project that was uh, initially supported by our PI program, which was the California Employment Consortium for Youth that was operated through the UCLA Tarjan Center. And we're really thankful to the work that the PI group has done because it helped us to figure out how do you really get all of these great agencies together to work effectively, to share information, to really want to do a great job. And that's what we found with PI support. So this group of uh, agencies that you see on the screen, the Department of Rehabilitation, the California Department of Education, the Department of Developmental Services, and all of this overseen by the California Health and Human Services agencies, they got together and said, you know what? we need to make a change. We have students with intellectual disabilities that are sitting at home doing nothing or in sheltered workshops or doing things that absolutely were doing them no good. And this project was uh, developed to make a change and to see that that didn't happen anymore. Next slide. All right, so after the state agency group got together and they come up with this great blueprint, then they went to all the communities and said, look, we have this great blueprint. We want you guys to take this information in your counties or local counties who've joined together and come up with some kind of an agreement on how you all are going to work together. So in Orange County, we call ours the Orange County Local Partnership Agreement, or we call it the OCLPA. Next slide, please. One of the first things that we did as a group, and I know that a couple of you guys have pointed out how uh, sometimes using acronyms is a problem. I think Keith and Serena um, encouraged us to try not to use acronyms. But for this particular group, because we had so many people from different agencies and we all had our own language, we all used different acronyms. And so that was one of the first thing we did was to create a glossary that included definitions and acronyms. So you can see on this list, we had people that came from all over the place to help us with this particular um, project that we wanted to do. Uh, we wanted to make sure we had the Department of Rehabilitation from two agencies or two different departments uh, in California who came together to help us. We had people from universities helping us. We had our local uh, regional center, which is the agency that controls uh, support for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We included our community colleges. We included some of our universities we had families and individuals with disabilities joining us. We had 16 public school districts and several other non-public uh, private schools who joined us. We had adult service providers. We had business partners. And then we had resource agencies that could provide us the kind of supports that we need. So um, originally, I think we only had about 15 people at our first meeting, and that was about almost four years ago. And we now have about 118 partners and some great folks that come together monthly to figure out what do we need to do to support competitive integrated employment. All right, next slide, please. 
All right, so we have our monthly meetings. We used to do them face-to-face -face pre COVID. We're planning to do that um, when things get back to regular. I don't know when that's going to be. But in the meantime, you know, we started with conference calls. Those didn't work too well, but once we started using Zoom, everybody really got excited about it. And we use Zoom meetings every single month. Next slide. But I wanted to show you how excited everybody was when we were face to face and we were sharing information. And of course, we will go back to this, but we'll probably keep Zoom meetings every other month. All right, next slide, please. All right, so I wanted to tell you, these are the collaboration activities that have been led by the Department of Rehabilitation since 2017. And that's, you know, a short, relatively short period of time. So we've started a universal referral process. We do monthly resource lists that we send out to people that include um, local resources, state resources, uh, webinars that people may want to take advantage of, Zoom meetings, anything that can provide people additional information about transition planning. We have business advisory committees. We have project search programs throughout the state. Uh, Person-driven planning process efforts are going on uh, everywhere to try to um, utilize, make sure that we're utilizing uh, the person-driven planning process, not just a, a person-centered plan, but an actual process. We're utilizing uh, the website. As I told you, we're building that. We have college to career programs. We um, make connections with our local WIOA, um, Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act. We do monthly steering committee Zoom calls. We have lots of competitive integrated employment opportunities that are happening. We've closed all of our uh, sheltered workshops, except for one. We have some families that are insisting they need to keep those. So, but we close a lot of them and a lot of folks are, are no longer in the sheltered workshops. We have um, monthly or weekly Ask the Experts Zoom conversations where we do transition topics and we have uh, experts from our OCLPA leadership group who are doing the Zoom conversations. I think we've had so far this year, we've had 25 and I think we have about 20 left for the year. And we also are doing our best to work on our career pathway business partner list and make sure that the individuals we work with have the opportunity to um, develop themselves on a career pathway so that they can start at entry level positions, but work their way up into careers of interest. Next slide, please. All right, this is our universal referral process. This is in a pilot stage. Um, what we decided to do was to figure out how we can better get folks together to help one individual who has a goal of going to work or going to school. And uh, right now, I think we have 14 different groups that are trying this uh, universal referral process out for us. And it really involves the families and the students bringing together all the potential service providers and trying to work on one plan to help this person get into the job or the work training that they want. Next slide, please. This is our person-centered plan document that we all share. Um, it's specific to employment. And this worked pretty well. We've redesigned it a couple of times and it's pretty simple. Talks about the individual skills they're bringing to the workplace, what their interests, hopes, and dreams are, what kind of support and accommodations they need. So it's pretty simple. Everyone likes to use it because it's a multi-agency document and it gets shared across agencies pretty easily and it's worked out well for us. All right, next slide, please. This is our actual universal referral tool. And this is where we write down the names of the organizations and agencies that we need to get together. And we want to work on work training, employment, and then make sure if there are support services that are needed, we actually bring that agency in as well when needed. And so it would be things like transportation or job coaching, or um, it could be just uh, getting interview clothes or something like that. Anyways, that's the tool that we're using. Next slide. And this is the service sheet that we created to outline the specific CIE, Competitive Integrated Employment Service needs, um, what kind of resources we think are gonna be needed, who's gonna provide them, the responsible person's name, and the timeline that we're estimating um, these service needs we'll be working on. And then we wanted to know what are the expected outcomes? Are we gonna get a job? Are we gonna get job retention, uh, benefits planning? 
Um, are we going to connect the student to post-secondary ed that will support the CIE plan? But that's what the service sheet looks like. And you can go to the next slide. Um, because this is a pilot that we're doing in Orange County, we wanted to make sure that we are asking people's opinions on how it works, um, what's not working, how we can make it better, and what we've uh, decided to do with Chapman University at the Thompson Policy Institute on Disability. We have some of their graduate students doing Qualtrics URP surveys uh, for the service providers and educators first, wanting to know how's this working for you? What agencies are you working with? And this will help us to um, take the process and move it out into larger numbers of uh, school districts and providers. Um, next slide, please. And most importantly, we wanted to survey the individuals with disabilities and their family members who participate in the process to find out how it worked for them. Does the process of getting all of these agencies and individuals together, and actually Zoom is making it a lot easier for us to do this, um, to discuss what we needed to do. And we have a lot of enthusiasm out there for this process. We have determined that not every student needs this type of um, intricate uh, resource sharing, but there are many students out there who have significant challenges, who have significant needs, who can benefit by getting everybody on the same page at the same time to identify what's needed to, number one, get these students into work-based learning while they're in school. And this has been a really big deal for some of our students who have more significant challenges. You know, we hear all different kinds of excuses about how this isn't gonna happen, but you know what? It can happen, it does happen, and we all need to get on the same page to make it happen though. All right, next slide. That's Is that it? it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so you much. Wrapped it up. So thank you so much. And really, that was such wonderful information you shared. And again, those resources are on the slide deck, but there also are links to um, those great resources you were talking about. So thanks, Linda. Welcome. Greatly appreciate thanks. it. Alrighty. So we have one last poll question. And we're going to go ahead and launch the poll. And this question is, do you share data collaboratively in planning for students with disabilities? So not just um, you know, internally in your education or VR system, but are you sharing it with each other? And again, not just the VR system and education system, but are you sharing with your other stakeholder partners? So we'll give you a little under a minute to answer that. And this is going to lead into our last discussion with our state presenters uh, from Iowa and California. So again, do you share data collaboratively in planning for students with disabilities? Okay, and um, it looks like um, kind of a, a combination here of sometimes and often. Um, it's good to see that that has moved up. I think we asked this question a few years ago. It was probably you know, more of a rarely or never. Um, so uh, again, it's great that we are working through that and that oftentimes, at least 38% of folks uh, are saying they are sharing data collaboratively across our interagency um, networks uh, and working with our students with disabilities. Ideally, just like with the first poll question, we would like to get to that point that it's always that this is common practice in how we're working uh, with each other. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and move on and we'll ask our state partners that same question um, and Linda, what are your thoughts? And I know you did mention um, all the different work that's happened in California, but your thoughts on data sharing and, and how that has affected the um, youth and um, students and young adults in California. You know, I can say, Michael, that this is one area that we definitely need to do a lot better. <laughs> um, I think we have done a great job with 
uh, data sharing between uh, the Department of Rehabilitation and the California Department of Education on certain grants, but it isn't really used uh, widely, but it sounds like Iowa is doing. We need to take a lesson from them to do a better job. Um, but what is really critical is trying to figure out a way to share uh, data, not only with the Department of Education, but also um, the uh, Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act through the Employment Development Department, the um, employment rate data that they have that's so awesome. And we want to make sure we're sharing the information from the Department of Developmental Services. And it is a project that we've been working on a long time, but have not been as successful as we want to. Locally, we share information, but I don't really consider it um, data sharing where we can actually uh, send it across uh, agencies electronically. So I, I think we have a lot of work to do in this area and it's definitely needed. Great, thank you. And I know that's something that Ruth and I and working with a number of our states um, across the country, the data piece is a data sharing piece does continue to be something that a number of folks have as um, a goal that they want to, to really try to do better with. Um, with that, I'm going to go back over to Kirsten and Mary and Iowa folks. So um, back to you guys in answering the same question about data sharing collaboration. Sure, thank you. So the memorandum of agreement that was shared earlier was actually amended um, back in May of 2020. And it's the Appendix A. Michael, I don't know if you want to scroll down there or not. Uh, um, I will do that. Sure. All this is listing out. So to explain, obviously, within our system, there's a lot of data points that we have to gather as a VR agency. And so the reason we amended this was to create a data sharing agreement between the Department of Ed and VR. Um, that way, behind the scenes, what we're working on right now is our systems. And by systems, I am not an IT person, so um, I'm going to use very broad terms here. But we're currently working on trying to get our systems to talk. So our case management system would essentially talk to the Department of Ed's data management system. And so right now, we're actually in the process of piloting this and trying to figure out how to make that happen. So the agreement, we met with the Department of Ed and it was actually easier than we thought to get this data sharing agreement in place because of all the work we had already done developing the memorandum of agreement overall. So that's why we decided to add the appendix on to the existing memorandum of agreement. And as he scrolls down through this, you can see that this kind of outlines the legal language that needs to happen, but then all the data points that we are going to actually share between the entities or between the agencies are going to be listed throughout this. So you guys can take a look at that and just see. Um, for those of you who are familiar, we use a document or reporting mechanism known as RSA or Rehabilitation Services Administration, RSA 911, essentially. So our data people went through that information on all the data we have to collect. We talked to the Department of on what they have to collect. And then we cross compared to figure out what data points we could share that would help both systems. So in Iowa, we have state student ID numbers that we use to identify the same student. So we have the same student identifier across the board. That's actually what we've been working on is making sure we have the same identifier right now. And what we're building in then is piloting having those systems talk so we can pull the information directly from the Department of Ed. So we're reporting the same information on the same students to both governing bodies. It will also help our internal staff um, with the burden of the data collection right now there's a lot of data points and if it's already being collected by the department of ed um, that takes away from our staff having to spend the time to collect all of that data and sharing that cross agency so that was an exciting development in iowa it was something we talked about for a while but like i said because we had that memorandum of agreement it made it easier to create this and now it's working out the bugs and how those systems exactly are going to talk. So I, hopefully in the future, I'll have more information to share on the success that we have behind that. Um, but we're figuring out how to make that work right now. 
The other thing in Iowa that we have developed that helps with sharing data is we have a lot of contracted programs across the state for transition services. So we contract a lot with um, pre-ETS or um, pre-employment transition services. Sorry, I know there's a lot of acronym in our language and I saw that in chat, so I'll try and spell those out for you. Um, but for like pre-ETS or those pre-employment transition services or other VR direct services that are being provided. And so what we ended up up doing in our case management system, we developed what we call an interface. And so that allows for our contracted staff that are running these programs for us and delivering these services to have direct access into our case management system. So all of the data, all of the assessments, anything that they're doing or collecting on students, they can enter directly into our system. Um, the other piece of that case noting is huge. It's uh, a lot of time and when we had contracted programs and didn't have the interface in place, it was a lot to figure out how to get their information and get it into our information and that it was a live time. We didn't want to miss time where maybe they collected it and it was a month and then it got entered in and our staff wasn't aware of what their staff was doing. So when you develop a collaborative um, process like that, it's live time. We know immediately what the contracted staff is doing with students and they know exactly where we're at in the process. So they can search our system. Um, we have access to see exactly what they've provided and it helps move services forward. It helps with the seamless transition um, for our students because that communication's happening and that collaboration is happening. So that interface that we developed, we actually started it with all of our larger contracted programs. Now we're at the point where we've seen such success in having that interface that we are actually moving to get all of the rest of our contracted programs into the interface. Um, this summer actually is when we're starting that project to get the rest in there. And so these contracted programs, some are directly with school districts, um, some are with CRP or community rehabilitation providers, and some are with other community partners. But whoever holds that contract and those contracted staff um, go through training, um, we cover all of the information for confidentiality, what would be needed, and then they will have direct access into our system to directly be able to enter and share that data with VR and vice versa. They can see exactly what we're doing. And again, it just helps with that communication. Um, it helps with being able to collaboratively plan for services and moving those services forward for the students with disabilities. And I don't know, personally, do you have anything to add? Or? You know, the only thing that I would add is that um, as a part of our CBI, um, the Capacity Building Institute through NTAC last year, um, our team was really focused on career technical education programs. And so as we started to look at data um, and gather data about students with disabilities accessing career technical education, um, we found that the data sharing agreement that that was already in place, that that's really beginning to help us access and compare data in a more efficient kind of way. If we hadn't had that in place, it would have been, um, a lot more difficult and, and I, I think there will be a lot of places over time that we um, will appreciate and use that data sharing agreement. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so Linda, Mary and Kristen, thank you again for sharing what's happening in Iowa and California. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this back over to Ruth and she's going to finish up with a few additional resource slides. So Ruth. Um, yeah, we just wanted to draw your attention to uh, a five-part webinar series on pre-employment transition services. Uh, each of the five webinars include curricula, activities, uh, state spotlights, example of expected outcomes, and ways to identify student progress, tips for successful service delivery, etc. And you can lo locate those um, through the link or um, through our website, uh, transitionta.org. Next slide. Um, this is a guide for VR and education uh, that was developed, and it really covers a lot of the things that we talked about today. And it's so, um, it's been just great to hear Iowa and California talk about everything they're doing, and a lot of it aligns with best practices uh, within uh, this guide. So we encourage you to check this out. Uh, it basically walks a local team through the process of building your team, 
uh, doing resource mapping, developing a plan, uh, getting down to uh, working with individual students. So uh, once again, there's a link and it's on the NTAC Collaborative website. And um, there's our contact information. Um, if uh, you want to reach out to any of us, and then I think we're going to open it up for questions. You know, Ruth, this is Kirsten, and I something that Mary and I thought of during the session that we didn't prepare and and um, include in the PowerPoint was a um, COVID. Um, tool, a, a tool to use with um, schools and pre, for pre ads and transition services around um, remote learning and in person learning and I'll share that in the chat but it has a lot of resources It follows our Iowa transition model. And okay. so for each step of the model, it takes you through how you would do that live but then what the adjustment might look like tools, resources, links, that kind of thing. And um, it was developed collaborative, collaboratively with um, state, regional, local, at IVRS and school folks. So um, I'll share that within the chat. Great, thank you for doing that. And if there's other states that are on, if you have similar types of uh, resources, that would be great to share. Sorry, didn't mean to jump in there, Ruth. Got no, that, that's perfect, <laughs> Michael. And that sounds wonderful, Kirsten. Um, I think everyone's looking for those resources. So um, did we have any questions? I know I've been answering a few. Um, Linda, one I, one I didn't know is, is VR in California under labor? Uh, uh, their, own, their own department, Department of Rehabilitation. Okay, all right. I know and they I, work hand in hand with the employment development department, but they're not underneath them. Okay, that was one question. Yeah, and then another question that came in was, was do all states do these MOUs and local school plans? It is required that an MOU be developed between education and VR at the state level. Uh, some states actually develop individual local uh, plans, uh, actually MOUs with, with local districts. Other folks might be like Iowa and develop those types of plans. And then there's some states um, I know that don't do that at the local level. Michael, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, I, and, I, and it came out of, it was WIOA. Um, when that was implemented. So I believe in talking with our partners uh, through WinTech, I think every state and territory has either in development or already has an MOU, but it, I agree with what you were just saying, Ruth, not every state does the local agreements or the LOUs. And there was a follow-up question to that is, how would you suggest requesting to see an MOU uh, between VR and education in your state? Generally, they are on the website. They're posted. Um, if you can't find them, you can always reach out to your, your state folks and just say, I'd like to, you know, direct to me where uh, I can find a copy, but reach out to your state VR education folks. But most of them are, are posted on websites. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, this is another one. As a parent, how can I encourage school districts to let parents of children with disabilities know about services provided by the state's uh, Department of Rehabilitation Services. I, I, and I think it would be an outreach, and Ruth, please jump in, but an outreach to your, that, your state's vocational rehab uh, partner. Uh, you know, usually there are transition folks and, and talk to them about what outreach efforts they have for families and for students, because I, I, most of the states we work with do have that in place. Um, so I, that would, I think contacting them um, and those partners would be one of my suggestions. And Ruth, I don't know if you have others. Well, and Mary, you might wanna jump in here too, friend. Um, but yeah, at the state level, you know, there's outreach, but then at, in the local districts, uh, most VR counselors and school districts work together to figure out uh, how to systematically uh, connect with students. So maybe 
I know one state developed a brochure and at every IEP at 14, uh, they're provided information about VR. Um, so figuring out systematic ways to get information to students and families are, I think are important. Mary, do you have anything to add from Iowa in terms of what you would suggest? Sure. So in Iowa, we actually encourage providing copies of the local school plans to parents that are interested in learning more. Um, like Kirsten had said earlier, we're we have a new IEP system that's being developed. And so within that system, there's going to be prompts about pre-ATS or those pre-employment transition services. And so they'll be linked in to additional resources and to the local school plans information so that parents can have access to that. We also have presented our local school plans at, we have an advisory council or a panel that's made up of parents that includes some of the advocacy groups as well that have been a part of developing what those templates look like and spreading the word for us. Um, and then we also on our website website have it listed out every high school across the state who the staff is that actually covers that high school so as parents are getting connected and aren't really sure who to talk to or they've never seen that local school plan they can access that information and then email that counselor directly to get a copy of that plan as a starter just to know what's available but then from there it's the continued conversations then of connecting the family with VR and talking about what those services look like in that district. And Linda, I know you all have done a lot of work, especially in Orange County around engaging families. I don't know if you want to share some of your work too. You know what? Families for us are key. We try to make sure we have families in all of our operating collaborative committees. Um, we do workshops for families on what the Department of Rehabilitation can offer. We have the DOR staff actually run those workshops. We have educators and DOR staff uh, present together. Um, now we're doing our, all of our workshops on Zoom. Um, the other thing I would suggest for families, that if they're not sure what the resources are, I would go to either the student's case carrier or to the special education office and ask that question. And oftentimes there may be something that's going on that the parent doesn't know about. Maybe the school district hasn't done as good a job as they should have making sure parents know what the resources are. Some of the districts have uh, resource guides, resource booklets. Um, the idea is to get the information out to families so they can figure out how to access these services. So ask a lot of questions, try to find out if there's any local collaboratives in your county that you can join or at least go and sit in on their Zoom meetings and um, hopefully the information's out there for them to get. Um, as part of this next question, uh, it's been my experience that sometimes the pre ed services that are offered within a school districts are, are really well coordinated. And in other cases, it seems to work in, in kind of parallel tracks between what the school district is doing around transition and what might be happening with pre -ets. Um So Erica's question was, how does pre ets and DVR work together? And I, and I think that'd be great to help clarify that for some folks where they're not necessarily seeing the connection. Mary, do you want to take, did you say pre ets and VR services? Right, yeah. The, the question is, you know, yeah, mine was more around pre ets and what's going on within the school districts. I think okay. that's one issue. And then I think another, which is Erica's, is uh, how does pre ets and DVR work together? Okay. Well, the first question, um, Michael, jump into, um, it really gets down to that resource mapping. And the schools that are really leveraging capacity are taking the time um, to have that conversation to, to identify what the school is offering. And given that, then what additional services can VR offer? Uh, without doing that, it's going to be hard, um, I believe, to really leverage services and, and not duplicate services if you're not having that conversation. So I really love um, the Iowa plan. I mean, that's specifically what, what we would suggest um, through Intact is, is have a process like this that you go through like once a year uh, because things will change from year to year. So, Michael, anything else that you would add to that? 
No, I agree. And that's why I kind of slid that over because I think, uh, Mary and Kristen, what you all are doing is what we really try to let folks know for that coordination between education and VR. I think internally with education too, we've done a lot of work with them doing a very similar process, looking at what's happening around transition services and pre-employment transition services that the school's providing, but even diving a little bit more uh, in depth and looking at each grade and see what's happening like in ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th grade. So that there is kind of this flow of services internally within education and then collaboratively with VR. And actually when it, within that pre ed guide that we um, shared a couple slides ago, there's a lot of um, tools in there to help locals do that. Uh, like there's a checklist and, and different things. Um, but yeah, it really gets down to what Mary and Kirsten were talking about in terms of sitting down and planning. But I guess the other question, Mary, if you want to dive in, is the coordination between pre eds and DVR services. Sure. Um, so, and I would just to add to what was being said, that is the essence of the local school plan. It has a column that outlines what programming is available in terms of pre from the district already, because what VR wants to focus on is the new and expanded services that can be provided through our agency. So that's that middle column that you see there. The other column, and there's actually a form that goes with this, that if you have more partners at the table, everybody has a column essentially on here where it's going to outline what is being provided by each of these entities and each of these areas. So if we had a contracted program, like I had mentioned earlier, that was providing some of these services, they would be listed out on here too. And it would clearly show what would be provided through that transition contracted program um, available in that district versus what VR is doing versus what the school district currently has to offer. Because there's a lot of overlap between when it comes to pre between what transition requirements are under, sorry, I'm gonna use another acronym, IDEA, their legislation versus WIOA, the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. There's a lot of overlap there. And that's actually why we created the local school plans is to help minimize that duplication and to help outline, this is what the school district is responsible for. And this is what they have that's available for programming in each of these pre ETS five required activity areas. Now, again, the focus is new and expanded services by VR. So what are we doing in each of those areas? These plans actually help us determine when and where and what type of contracted program we need to develop. Because as a part of this, uh, down a little bit farther on here, there's a section that gaps and services are identified. And so if there are any gaps in service delivery, this is where we start having conversations with the district and start talking to our community partners. Is there something else we should be doing? Is there a program we should be developing? Is there some new or innovative strategy that we haven't tried and we need to bring in some more partners to help us deliver those pre ETS activities in that school district? So all of these conversations is what drives what service delivery would look like um, for pre ETS in all of the districts across the state. I'm not sure if that answered your question or not, but. Good, yeah, thank you. Um, other question that came in is, are either of these state experiences uh, experiencing difficulty in, and then it's a two part, meeting the WIOA spending requirements and B, ensuring all potentially eligible students with disabilities have access to pre-employment transition services. How are your collaborative approaches supporting these objectives? Go ahead, Mary. Okay, I was like, do you want me to jump in? Yeah, um, we do. Okay. <laughs> So when it comes to making sure all the students have access, that is actually when Kirsten had mentioned, we are building in our pre ETS language into the new IEP system. So if there are students that haven't been connected within our system as potentially eligible, there's going to be prompts within that system that ask the teacher um, that's working with that student is, are they connected as potentially eligible? Has the pre ETS agreement that we use to get students signed up as potentially eligible with our agency, has that been completed? Um, we've talked about, and I don't know if it's going to be phase two, Kirsten, of even adding a checkbox that indicates this has been done with the VR agency, so they are connected. So if there are students that we are missing for some reason, um, that will help us hopefully catch that. And like I said, in those school districts where we have our contracted programs and they have the interface, they can directly look into our system and see our 
are they connected um, within our agency? And if not, we need to get that connection going so that student can get served through pre -ed. So we're trying to come up with strategies in Iowa. Sorry, what was your first question that you, I think I skipped over that. Well, it was two part. Go ahead. Yeah, it was about spending your 15%, Mary. Yes, and in Iowa, we are spending our 15%. We are meeting that requirement in Iowa. So um, we have had to do some carry forward dollars and push it back, but um, we are shortening that gap in time and are we are currently meeting our 15%, yes. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, and I wanna thank all of you that, um, okay, wait, one more quick question, and I think I'll, I'll get into the wrap up. When you all are saying people with disabilities, does this, does this any student with a disability, or is this really just focused on students with IDD? Um, I can jump in. <laughs> uh, so students with disabilities um, would be any student with a disability in the state of Iowa between the ages of 14 um, all the way up until their 22nd birthday is how we have that defined for student with a disability. So when we're talking about pre -ets, if they're in a recognized educational program, such as if they're in high school, like we're talking about today, um, if they're in the post-secondary setting, um, or if they're in another recognized educational program, they would have access to pre -ets. So when we say students with disabilities, that's who we would be talking about there. And Linda, did you want to add something? I just wanted to add in California, it's all students with disabilities, uh, whether they're in the school system or in some type of community college or university within the required age range. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank all of you who are participating in this webinar and with these questions, because if you've had these questions, you can be sure others that were on this webinar had those too. And I think that really kind of help round out our, our presentation very nicely. Um, uh, uh, Kirsten and Mary in Iowa and Linda in California, and of course, Michael and Ruth uh, with NTAC Collaborative. Thank you so much for all this wonderful information. And you just did a great job. And uh, the way you kind of coordinated the information, we really appreciate the effort that you put in uh, to making this presentation run so well. And uh, for all of you, uh, there's a lot of back and forth about the different resources and access to these PowerPoint slides. And some of you went to some of these resources and websites, and I think there's a little trouble accessing some of those links. Uh, so just know that you can always contact us at the Yes Center if you want any follow-up in terms of any of these resources or any of access to any of these websites. So uh, please uh, continue to consider uh, the Yes Center uh, as a source of, uh, of information and for resources and to answer any of the questions that you have. And of course, uh, consider the NTAC Collaborative and, and all those wonderful folks over there, because uh, obviously they, they have a lot of information, resources, uh, and, and, and can be there for you as it relates to transition services. So with that, I wanna thank uh, everybody and Donald for the tech of the technology part on this, and we hope you all have a good uh, rest of your day.